Hello, everyone, and welcome to Profiling Evil Podcasts. 36 years ago, Lloyd Reese and his buddy David Jaramillo stole a license plate, put it on a vehicle, and drove to a nearby lake where they intended on partying throughout the day. They never returned home. The decades passed, and finally an anthropology student reached out to our friends at Adventures with Purpose, asking if they thought the boys might be in a lake. Well, AWP called Profiling Evil, knowing this case was in our backyard, and it launched an eight-week journey that included building a team of public and private collaborators to investigate what could prove to be a homicide. Let's explore how we ended up searching the murky depths of East Canyon Reservoir in northern Utah. Fourteen-year-old Lloyd Reese jumped into the brown Datsun B210 driven by his 21-year-old friend, David Jaramillo. He said hello to Jaramillo's older brother, Perry, and his girlfriend, Felicia, who were sitting in the back. Their destination? East Canyon Reservoir, located just one hour east of Salt Lake City, Utah, in the Rocky Mountains of the United States. Since Jaramillo's vehicle wasn't registered, the kids stole a license plate hoping that that might help them avoid police attention. Getting caught could have actually saved their lives. Well, when Jared Lysick from Adventures with Purpose initially reached out to me, his information on the case was pretty minimal. The tip started with a Colorado State forensic anthropology student named Sarah Clater. She follows true crime and spends her free time trying to connect the dots between discovered remains and missing persons cases. Sarah's efforts are proof that great things can happen from those of you in the user community. Timing's critical, but I'd encourage you to submit cases through the evidence room. We do look at them, and from time to time, we're able to take them and do something with them. Here's a perfect example. As I spoke with Jared, he committed to bring his team and equipment to Utah if we could provide any additional insight into the probability that a prescriptive search was warranted. Before I would commit to helping, I told him I needed a week to look into this 36-year-old case. And, and as I did, I found a number of older news stories. The reports clearly put Reese and Jaramillo at the reservoir, but nothing else was satisfying the itch that I had. According to Lloyd's sister, their mom and dad were struggling to keep their little family together. They both suffered with severe drug addictions, something that would plague the rest of the family as well. Lloyd had very little oversight in his home or, or even direction from his parents. He had a brother named Wayne, and the two fought with each other from time to time. Not just like normal brothers fight, sometimes Wayne would unintentionally even hurt his younger brother. Lloyd had two sisters, but the youngest, seven-year-old Thunder, had him wrapped around her finger. It appears that Lloyd was well-known and he had a lot of friends. He loved listening to Ted Nugent, Aerosmith, and ACDC. You know, he and I actually graduated from the same middle school, Glendale Junior High School. He dreamed of being a doctor. Lloyd must have felt like such a big kid as they pulled out of the Reese driveway at 1700 South, just east of State Street in Salt Lake City. The Reese home was less than a block from South High School, the high school of my youth until I moved in my senior year. I knew the area well, and I must have walked past their home a dozen times, never realizing that it would be meaningful to me some 45 years later. Let's take a minute and, and listen to, as Jared and I talk about teaming up on this case. So, Jared, let's go back a little bit in time when you first reach out to Profiling Evil to talk about the Lloyd Reese case. Let's talk a little bit about what you initially learned and why you reached out to me. Yeah, so with that one, you know, I reached, I mainly reached out to you because this is, this is in your own backyard, Mike. You know, I mean, Ogden to East Canyon Reservoir was 45 minutes. and you're also dealing with a 
you know, a missing loved one from Salt Lake. And so just being within the entire Wasatch Valley range, I'm like, you know what? If anything, if anybody knows anything about this, it's got to be Mike. Well, I discovered the boys were reported missing in Salt Lake City and that the police department still had the case open and assigned to a detective. My requests for a phone call were ignored, <laughs> but I did receive an email that suggested I file a, a FOIA request, a freedom of information request. That could take months to get. More disappointing than the fact that they wouldn't talk to me directly was that most of the report would probably be redacted. So I decided I was just going to hunt down the family and talk to them instead. Specifically, one of the last people to see Lloyd Reese alive, his sister, Thunder. At first, Thunder was apprehensive, <laughs> understandably so. I mean, she's been on an emotional roller coaster for more than three decades. Things changed, though, as we talked. It was really important for Thunder to learn more about profiling evil and adventures with purpose. She needed to know that we would do what we promised her we would do. And after a number of discussions with the three of us, uh, we determined that we'd tackle this missing persons case together. Thunder had been working for a number of years with a Salt Lake City-based cold case group that, frankly, had not been able to provide many answers for her. We asked her to give the organization our names and numbers with an invitation that we'd like to team up with them and support their efforts. For weeks, we waited as Thunder made multiple pleas to the group to team, and, and eventually we chose to move forward be, because they just would never reach back out. I think Jared said it best when we decided to move forward without him. Let's listen as we talked about that. Because she had been working with some other organizations and was a little bit uh, confused about the reach out. Why don't you just talk for a moment about your experience first re meeting with her and and uh, what was really the turning point for her that uh, working with us was the way to go? You know, I think it really comes down to results. You know, other organizations, they come in with good intentions of wanting to help. But the problem is, is when they do so, and they've never even have a solved case of their own to begin with, that a lot of times, you know, it's clout chasing with the, hey, we're doing good things. Make sure we get the news there, even though we're never going to have any results. We hope that we have results from it, but we're really not going to be doing enough that's going to garner us results. And so what that does is it gets the family's hopes up because they're reaching. They, they're, they're looking for any signs of help to get things because here we are 35 years later and, and the family feels as though law enforcement has, you know, forgot about them and never helped them to begin with is the way that a lot of them feel. And so any outreach is appreciated until you feel like you get burned. And I think that that's kind of where Thunder was at at this moment in time is this that a year ago, this organization reached out and said, hey, we're going to help out. And then zero movement. And so then them being the last point of contact, she reaches out to them again, says, hey, you know, are you doing anything? Oh, yeah, we're going to be getting on it again. Maybe we, we have plans to do this. And so I understand how you know, apprehensive a family can be with the, oh, here's just some more broken promises. We don't know if they're going to be able to help until Thunder really took the time to, oh, they help this family and this family is this family. And these are all recent and they have this technology and they have all these people that come together to help out. And you know what? I do need to reach out to them and see what they have to say. And it was an incredible interaction with Thunder just from the get-go and her support and being up there with us side by side. And, you know, Thunder vividly recalls the day that Lloyd left with Jaramillo and the others. She had a really bad feeling about things and she remembers begging her brother to stay home. Her mother was in Las Vegas partying and she really doesn't recall where her father was. Well, Lloyd assured her that he would be home soon, and then he walked with her to a corner market where he stole a candy bar to give to her and her little brother. She remembers eating the candy while crying and watching her brother drive away. As they did, Lloyd's last words to her were a promise that he would be back soon. Well, he never returned.
We asked Thunder about her experience reporting Lloyd's disappearance and how this case has affected her throughout her life. I'd like you to watch this video of her describing the impact that this has had. So they weren't around very often. And so the day that they left, uh, it was just us kids at the house and some friends and everybody was partying. Well, my brother, two, both of my brothers had gotten in an argument and they had gotten in a fight. And so Lloyd decided that he was going to go to East County with some friends. They got in an argument over something. I don't know what it was. Um, they ended up getting in like a fist fight. And then Lloyd was, somebody offered for them to come up here. Lloyd took it up, took up the offer. He called my mom, wherever she was at, asked her for permission. She said yes. Um, he was getting ready to leave. I was crying, begging him not to go. Friends that were there at the house were begging him not to go. You know, I don't know, something just didn't sit well. Nobody wanted him to go. And to calm me down, he ended up walking to Circle K, which was on 17 South and State Street at the time. He took us down there and he stole me and my little brother a candy bar and he walked me back and he broke it in he sent me back up on the back of the car and he broke it in half and he gave half to my little brother and he gave half to me and i was crying i was begging him not to go and he told me he says thunder i promise he's like i'm going to be back he's like i will be back in a little bit he's like just be good stay out of everybody's way he's like just go play your room go play with david he's like and before you know it i'll be back and he never came back well with a better understanding of where the boys were going i used mapping software donated to profiling evil by our friends over at esri I started by plotting the most probable route they would have driven, and the analysis suggested that they would have traveled east from their home and through Emigration Canyon. The entire trip to the reservoir would take about an hour, and it would go past Mountain Dell Reservoir and over a windy road across the summit before dropping into the valley where the lake is located. Evidence uncovered supported the claim that the boys did in fact make it to the lake with their passengers, Perry and Felicia. There were three witnesses who came forward in 1985, and they indicated that the boys parked their car on the northeast end of the lake in a little inlet known as Dixie Hollow. Two of the three witnesses were actually passengers in the car, Perry and Felicia and they would report that they were left behind by the two boys with no way to get home and no conversation alerting them that the boys were leaving. One of those passengers, again, was Jaramillo's older brother, Perry, who's now deceased. The other passenger, though, was a woman named Felicia, who police could never locate to interview. I found this strange, though, since the third witness to this, Jaramillo's father, knew who Felicia was. Nonetheless, the witnesses reported the boys were drinking and swimming in the lake for much of the day. Some wonder if they could have drowned and remained in the bottom of the cold lake, which in that area is about 80 feet deep. Well, you know, this doesn't seem likely to me because Jaramillo's father reportedly saw the boys drive off in the Datsun B210. And, frankly, the vehicle was never located. So, um, after... He didn't come so back. Today, I, guess, I tried reporting him missing exactly. because my mom today, wasn't doing it. My mom just kept saying, oh, it. he's out uh, being a kid like partying. He'll be back. And so I tried reporting him a couple times and the police kept telling me I was too young that I need to have my parents call. But I knew my mom wasn't going to call. And so growing up, I, I struggled with it. I had a really hard time because my mom didn't do nothing. And I don't know if it was because of the drugs or what it was because of. And so grow, as I grew up older, I ended up getting into drugs and just kind of gave up on life for a while. Um, I had four kids and that didn't even pull me out of it. I ended up giving my kids up for adoption just because I felt that they deserved better. Um, I finally pulled myself out of the drug life and pulled my life back together. And about that time is when I decided it was really time to start trying to find them. And I was trying to do what I could, but I didn't know anybody. 
I didn't know who to reach out to. And every time the police would get a hold of me and they'd be like, oh, we're going to relook at the case, it was just like opening an old wound because they would come, they would talk to us, and then nothing would come of it. The notes in the police report suggest that they might have driven back southbound the same way that they came. Well, after looking at possible routes back to Salt Lake City, there were really only three pathways that they could have taken. The, the northern route seemed very unlikely, so we concentrated on the southern and the western roads in and out. Behaviorally, it, it just didn't seem probable the boys would have left the other two up at the lake without a way home. So we have to consider that the boys may have been just exploring around the lake perhaps while looking for a store or a gas station. But regardless, we focused our GIS analysis on two possible routes back to Salt Lake City. One, traveling back the way they came, or going west and making a full loop, traveling past the dam. In looking at the first two options, there didn't appear to be any areas where the boys could have driven off the road and crashed without a high probability, especially after 36 years, of having that vehicle discovered. So our focus turned to the lake, and having experts like Adventures with Purpose was the only viable solution to finding the boys. Hey everybody, Mike from Profiling Evil Podcasts. You're listening to our episode about Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo, two young men who disappeared 36 years ago. That's right, in 1985, these boys left to their Salt Lake City home to go to East Canyon Reservoir. It was there that they disappeared and where we're focusing our efforts on this search with our friends over at Adventures with Purpose. I want to thank Dr. Pepper for taking care of the team while we were out and about. Hey, let's get back to the show. We looked for areas where the road that surrounded the lake came perilously close to the water's edge, places where the vehicle could have plummeted into the water and sunk to the bottom, hidden from view. I examined the topography of the lake's bottom and determined that there were three possible locations where the vehicle could have left the road. The first location was just south of the spot they were last seen in at Dixie Hollow. It was a section of road crossing over some of the backwaters of the lake in an area called Taylor Hollow. Now examining this spot revealed that the water levels were actually quite low and anything that would have plunged from the roadway in that location would have been spotted by passerbys or fishermen. In some low water years, frankly, it nearly dries up. So next, we examined the northwest finger of the lake, where the highway runs alongside the lake for about six-tenths of a mile. There's a hundred-foot-plus steep embankment between the road and the water, with a few, if any, barricades along the road's edge. At the shallowest point, the water is about 50 feet deep. This could easily uh, hide the vehicle but the water is as deep as 122 feet in roughly 25% of the route. Now, I knew this was an area that Jared and Sam could really help, especially since the two of them are some of the few people in the country that have the capability to run deep water sonar. The most probable place on the lake happened to be near this section, where the road takes a sharp hairpin turn to the west. While there's a barrier in place today, it didn't exist until about three years ago. So any vehicle that went off that embankment could plummet to the water and then sink nearly 265 feet below the road surface. There, it would likely be pulled by the currents into the cliffs and crevices of the lake's bottom. If the boys had been drinking and were recklessly driving uh, this windy road near the dam, it's highly probable that they didn't safely negotiate the 90-degree turn to the west, the the turn that just passes the dam. The edge of the road is only 15 feet from the steep embankment, and, and there was, again, no barrier to stop the car at that time. So if the vehicle didn't negotiate the curve, even traveling the speed limit, it could have been impossible to correct the trajectory and avoid crashing into the water below. 
Well, Jared and I spoke multiple times via FaceTime from this location as we homed in on the area that was the most likely spot for an accident and a watery grave. How beneficial was that in trying to determine the final spots where we really were going to search? We, you know, first of all, it comes back to the, we had to know what the contours were before we could even begin. Because here's the thing is, how deep is the lake? We as divers, you know, we can do 130, 140, you know, 150 if we want to push it. Um, but here's the thing. Normally that lake is 160 to 180 feet deep. But we got really lucky because here we are at the end of summer. And so knowing that the deepest part of the lake is, you know, 160 plus and the water levels down 50 or 60 feet, that puts me, you know, right around 120 feet, which is actually what we ended up hitting on a couple of our dives there. That really helped out in our planning as to how we're going to tackle this, because now what type of equipment do we need to bring as well? What we have on the boats is good to, you know, 50, 55 feet. But the moment we start getting over that, it really, you know, becomes a much different picture for us, especially when you're dealing with steep hillsides. And so then we know, all right, we need the tow fish instead of the re regular side scan and down imaging equipment that we use on the boats. It became apparent I needed a little more information, though. So I called my friend, Chief Eric Young of nearby Ogden City Police Department to see if I could borrow one of his drone pilots to create a 3D image of the scene. Well, he graciously sent two pilots from the Real-Time Crime Center, Josh Terry, a crime analyst, and Officer Heather West. The location posed an entire set of challenges that we weren't anticipating, and, and we realized that we're going to need the help of the local sheriff, the state parks department, and the United States government in order to pull off this search. So my next call was to Morgan County Sheriff Blaine Brashears, the law enforcement agency with responsibility for the entire area. Sheriff Brashears was supportive of the idea of searching and setting up a meeting with East Canyon State Park Manager Chris Haramoto, a seasoned police officer. Let's listen in on my conversation with Sheriff Brashears about the logistics of putting something like this thing together. Pay close attention to some of the lessons learned through this joint public and private partnership. Folks, please be mindful that there's going to be some background noise created by the wind. I hope that you'll be understanding of that. So, Sheriff, thanks a lot for all the help you gave on this. I mean, this was a pretty incredible uh, challenge, number one, to get all of the permits done. But it also was uh, a little bit risky for a uh, for you to take a group of people that were pretty unproven and unknown to you and put them to work. But what are your thoughts so far? It's, you know, it, when it first came, I was a little leery, but I, I'm glad we have. I'm glad we had this opportunity. These guys have been great to work with, um, both groups that have come out and assisted. Um, I'm really hoping that we can finish this up and get it done. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a pleasure for us to, to be involved with some professional, very professional individuals and um, we've had some challenges and they've been great to accommodate and to work around them and things like that. And they've been, I have nothing but high marks for them, really. Oh, good. Okay. That's awesome. You know, one of the things I've been trying to better understand, having spent a career in law enforcement and now dabbling on this private side, <laughs> is how we can somehow harness all of the people that want to do good, but do it in a controlled fashion. I've learned a lot of lessons in the last couple of days about Maybe uh, MOUs should have been in place about about uh, um, who who was the site commander and other things. But I don't know. What have your thoughts been? And, and is there room for other law enforcement agencies to learn from this and take advantage of groups like this? Yeah, naturally, we we have a tendency of kind of closing off and saying, oh, no, no, I don't want them in here and things like that. But I, I look at it that anybody that can help and assist um, we only have so much capabilities, and these individuals are experts in their field. And, yeah, we learn. And we stick ourselves out there, and we're like, oh, we won't do that next time, or, hey, we can do better this time. And so it's good. And I, I would tell people, don't don't be scared to do this. It's um, nothing that we've, the challenges we've hit has been anything real drastic. It's just little hiccups that we have to work through. And, yeah, it took a little longer to get the permits and, and things like that. We're so used to, and as you know, through law enforcement, we get in there and take care of business immediately and move on. 
Well, after reviewing the maps and discussing the case, we both agreed that a search near the dam was warranted, but it couldn't happen without first obtaining permission from the United States Bureau of Reclamation. They were responsible for the federally secured area next to the dam, which fell within concerns of Homeland Security and Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. East Canyon Dam was first built in 1896 when more than a hundred canal companies came together in hopes of diverting water from the rivers that fed that entire basin. Three years later, they completed the first earthen dam consisting of dirt and rock, and they had steel sheets of metal to help secure the foundation. Well, over the course of several years, the dam was raised an additional 25 feet. But by the end of 1915, safety concerns over the integrity of the dam surfaced. So the Bureau of Reclamation stepped in and built a more secure arched structure, ultimately raising the dam level to its current height of 265 feet above the bedrock. Well, as the sheriff and the park director went to work in getting permits for the search, Jared and I started strategizing about how we were going to pull this search effort off. It would undoubtedly require the entire Adventures with Purpose team, which included Sam Ginn, another YouTube creator known as Sam Sam the Adventure Man, their support staff, and of course, the Profiling Evil team. The immediate challenge was Adventures with Purpose would need to clear the nearly one mile long stretch of water to the north of the dam using their deep water penetrating sonar. The search inside the federally protected waters would have to be done quickly, leaving only one day to search and then one day to recover anything that we found. Jared and I spent hours going over and and reviewing our plans. If the vehicle was located, the process of freeing the vehicle from the mud below and then surfacing it was a daunting task. If we were lucky enough to get the vehicle off the lake floor some 120 feet down, we'd need heavy equipment to pull it up the 100-foot cliffs to the roadside. If that wasn't possible, we'd need to tow the recovered vehicle more than a half of a mile to the boat docks and then winch it onto a wrecker to be taken into custody and become evidence by the sheriff's office. Well, we reached out to two friends to help make this happen. First, I called my buddy Chuck Hadley and team at Stoffer Towing. Stoffers are experts at pulling large objects like overturned 18-wheel trucks out of tight spaces. Chuck and I went to high school together, and, and we jumped at the chance to, hit, to work on this thing together. I can't thank the team at Stoffers enough, Curtis and Cody Stoffer. They volunteered all of the help for this effort. Having their equipment on site was costly, yet they donated everything wanting to help Thunder's family and hoping that they might help in finding some resolution. Let's take a minute and listen as Chuck Hadley explains the kind of equipment that's needed and that will be used to pull any recovered vehicles and other hazards from the protected area of the lake. Hey folks, I'm with Chuck Hadley from Stoffer Towing. Uh, This company has really stepped up to help not only pull these cars, but to help us clean up some of the environment too. Chuck, thanks a lot for your help. Tell us what you're gonna be doing today. So today, right now, we have some uh, items here on the shore that we're gonna be removing for the Bureau of Reclamation that they have no way of getting out. So that's what we're gonna do now. And then when they float the cars, we're gonna see what we can do to get them out of the lake for them. So, you know, um, we've got some other footage, but the Bureau's asked us not to film the water and pull this coming up. So I'm not panning over to show where we're at, but maybe you could describe what kind of a challenge this is and why you need to use a vehicle like this, because this this uh, just isn't a normal tow truck. No, this is a 60-ton rotary tow truck, so it'll swing out. It'll rotate to the side. The items that we need to get right now is about 75 feet off the shore or off the road. Just the fact that you would come in and do this at no expense, and and for this family that's hoping to recover a family member in a car, uh, that's a pretty remarkable thing you've done, so thank you. You betcha. Our company loves to help. They 
They love to do. They love to do things for uh, other people, for the environment. So this is a way that we give back to society. This is our way of paying back for everything that's helped us become what we are. Now, knowing that we needed some heavy duty support on the water, Jared reached out to another well-known YouTuber and television personality, Dave Sparks. You, you might know him as Heavy D. Well, he and his partner, Dave Kiley, known as Diesel Dave, jumped at the chance to help out. I hope you're going to go to their, their uh, YouTube channel and also watch them on Discovery Channel, the Diesel Brothers. Well, with their inclusion, our team was ready to go to work. But we couldn't do anything until we had the federal permits to dive and search in the protected barrier near the dam. Ranger Haramoto and Sheriff Bashirs worked tirelessly to secure the permits with the federal government, while I went to work with the leadership at the Weber Conservancy District. When, when our first planned search date came and went without the permits, we frankly began to lose hope. Adventures with Purpose agreed that they would still come to search the area in the open general areas, but we knew that without the permits, it would likely be wasted time. Nonetheless, we were so moved by Thunder and her story that we agreed that we were going to move forward as a show of support for her family. We, we just felt like they needed to know that there were people who cared and that were there to help them in their quest to find loved ones. Well, after that first date passed, we set our final search date for August 10th and 11th. We didn't tell anybody except Thunder of our plans, and we pressed forward with faith that somehow the feds would come through. Jared's team began their drive from Oregon on the 9th of August, and I worked with the sheriff and the ranger to push and prod the local, state, and federal authorities to get the permits signed. Miraculously, and, and in the 11th hour, the permits were signed, just as AWP was pulling into Utah and then into my neighborhood. We were going to be searching the dam the following morning, but none of us imagined how challenging the next couple of days would be. Well, make sure that you join us for our next video as Profiling Evil, Adventures with Purpose, the Diesel Brothers, and Stoffer's Brother Towing tackle what would prove to be one of the most difficult vehicle searches they have ever done. Hey, folks. Please hit the like and the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you receive all of our notifications. And thanks for supporting us at Profiling Evil. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.